Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Raleigh Hutton. Some of you probably know my wife, Suzette, a lot better. Suzette Gugamus, she grew up going to Bible Bible Camp, and she remembers a lot about this church. And if you don't know Suzette, you probably know my mother in grace. I don't call her my mother-in-law. She's my mother in grace. And you probably know Joy Gugamus. And if you ever shopped at the House of Fashion in Burwell, that was my mother in grace's store. So we love being a part of the Ord Christian Church, and I love it, Ed, when you do uh, meditations because you and your family have had such a powerful impact on Suzette's family, so it's always good for us to be here. Uh, I am one of those guys that is a terrible church member because even though Ord Christian is our home church, we're on the road a lot, and so we kind of come and go and uh, pop in and out. Uh, and so we get an opportunity to see a lot of different churches, and we see a lot of different prayer requests. I ran across a prayer request that said, please pray for my husband, who very tragically got me nothing for our anniversary when I specifically told him I wanted nothing for our anniversary. Now, some of you junior high boys are thinking, I don't get it. You need to ask your mother what that really means, so... Uh, and we do love being a part of this church, and I want you to know uh, how much we appreciate your preacher. And all kidding aside, I get to travel a lot, and I'm in a lot of different churches, and uh, Doug and his family are keepers. And I appreciate the leadership of this church and the elders, and especially during this season, how you have come alongside of Doug. And if I could just uh, be so bold here this morning... I really do think the next generation of church leaders are going to come out of churches like Ord Christian Church. I think there's just something about what you have going here, and Suzette and I talk about it every time we leave. We, we look at the number of families and children and their bright eyes and the way that they interact with each other. I, I am convinced that the next generation of church leaders are going to come out of churches just like this. I grew up in a rural town in Montana. Uh, Wellen Jones uh, taught my junior high youth group, and you look up the word integrity, and you'll see a picture of Wellen Jones. And I just want to talk to some of the younger men here. I, I just want you to know that what you do, those things stick. And when young men are in junior high, they catch on to that kind of stuff. And so living your life the way you do is really important. And Suzette remembers uh, when she was a part of the Burwell Church growing up, and you would have the Good Friday or the Sunrise Service, if I remember right. Different churches would take turns hosting it. My church always had a Sunrise Service, and I think back uh, with such uh, great memories. We had one elder in the church; his name was Gene Sangwins. Every year, you could count on him coming out with pancakes, and he would say, "Few men and no women can make pancakes as good as I make them." And he was also the one that used to say, it doesn't take much water to make good coffee. <laughs> and his coffee was stout. So I grew up right on the Canadian border in Montana. And whenever people think of Montana, you oftentimes think of the mountains. That's not where I'm from. Uh, where I'm from, it was flat. Uh, you could watch your dog run away for three days. <laughs> it was that flat. And... Uh, You'd get out on the porch and go, uh, he's okay, he's not even to Bracken yet, we'll just let him run. So, so while Suzette and I were in Haver, uh, Haver, Montana, I would drive to my home church on Sunday nights, and uh, they didn't have a preacher, they still don't have a preacher, they're very rural, but I would go out to my home church on Sunday nights, and then I would drive back towards Haver, and we were on what was called the Big Flat, and you'd come to the edge of the Big Flat, and there was Powell Hill. And Powell Hill would kind of take you into the Milk River Valley. And I would always allow myself, from the time I left Turner to the time I got to Powell Hill, to not think about the following week's sermon. And I don't know if you realize the pressure that your preacher, Doug, is under, all kidding aside, to put together a sermon every week. I remember my favorite definition of preaching is... Uh, you have a baby on Sunday, and you find out you're pregnant on Monday. That's what it means to preach. 
And so I would allow myself to not think about my next sermon until I got to the top of Powell Hill. But oftentimes in the wintertime, uh, especially the colder it got, I-, I could stop my car and just watch the northern lights. And you could just see the northern lights dance. And there was just something about stopping there and watching the handiwork of God and looking out over the Milk River Valley and you'd see the you just see those northern lights and the different colors that would come about. And more times than not, I would just stop and think, you know, someone has to be behind this. Someone has to orchestrate this. And to be honest with you, no one's ever had to teach me about a creator. You just simply have to open your eyes. You take a look at a bumblebee and you watch it fly and you say, how in the world can that be? Or I think, Warren, when you're sitting in a goose blind and you're watching the sun coming up in the morning and the life is just kind of coming around, no one has to tell you that there was a creator that designed all that. This last New Year's, we met our son and his daughter down in Florida And we just kind of hung out on the beach, and there was one night in particular, we were headed back to the motel, and it was getting close to sunset, and we decided, you know what, we're just going to watch the sun go down. So we turned around, came, and, you know, up and down the beach, there was just people as far as you could see, and we just all sat there together and just watched that sunset. And there was one van in particular uh, sitting over there, just tons of kids, uh, Looked like a hackle van, maybe. And then, anyway, just uh, tons of kids everywhere. And pretty soon, two of the kids just applauded when, when the sun went down. And you couldn't help but think, who are they applauding? Who's the gratitude that they're showing to? Someone had to have done this. I preached for 37 years, and it never occurred to me to try to teach about creation apart from a creator. It's so intricately designed and woven together. I think it's just self-evident that you and I have a designer. And I think about Jesus and his disciples. The majority of the time, they met outside. A handful of them were professional fishermen. And if you have your scriptures with you this morning, I want to take you to the book of Matthew. This is where we're going to pick up the story. If you want to go to the center of your Bible and then just kind of to- turn to the right, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are just four different men, and they're talking about the same life of Jesus. And Matthew writes from a Jewish perspective. You know, that's why he's so important. It's so important to him to include the genealogy because he wants to prove that Jesus was a descendant of David and of Abraham. And Mark is kind of the Reader's Digest condensed version of the life of Jesus. But Mark kind of throws a few details into some of the stories that everybody else leaves out. And you'll see this in this story. Luke, he's a doctor. Dr. Luke. Eddie made reference to him this morning. And he's a physician, so he wants to prove to you the power that Jesus had. And John was just Jesus' best friend the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, the disciples that Jesus spent time with probably memorized a lot of Old Testament scriptures. And today we're going to pick up this story in kind of a notoriously dangerous body of water. The winds would oftentimes sweep in from the side of the mountains and a storm would just literally pop up within minutes. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 8 Begin with verse 23. Then he, talking about Jesus, got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, Ye of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves. And it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. In fact, uh, 
<laughs> when I was in Bible college, I took Greek one my freshman year. I got a D. I thought, well, if I'm going to go on, I better take it again. So I took it my sophomore year, Ed, and I still got a D. I figured God was telling me, don't worry about taking Greek. So I stopped taking Greek. But those who know Greek will tell you that the Greek word here, when it's talking about the size of the storm, is the word seismos. It's where you and I get the whole idea of this huge seismic storm. All of a sudden, there's this turbulent shaking, there's this huge squall, and the disciples are afraid. And where do we find Jesus? He's sleeping. Now, the guys that Jesus is with, some of them were fishermen, and they knew the body count of this sea. They knew the story. They knew the history. They knew the legends of what was taking place. And the rain is pelting, and the waves come over the boat. And in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, it says that Jesus got up and he rebuked the winds. Mark's account is found in Mark chapter 4 and verse 39. It says, peace be still. I just want to remind you that the miracle is not that the storm stopped. All storms eventually stop. The miracle is that it stopped immediately. See, Jesus was not crafting the storm. He didn't make it calm after an hour, after 60 minutes. He rebuked the winds. Mark says, he said, peace be still. And then in verse 27, the disciples say, who is this man? Even the wind and waves obey him. Here's Jesus who isn't afraid in the storm. He doesn't bring a life jacket. Mark, once again, who kind of inserts just different bits of information. Mark is the one that tells us that Jesus was the one who was asleep on a pillow. And the question I think that is the most important is, who is this man? He's greater than any storm that comes our way. And it's amazing to me that the disciples go from in a few minutes of being afraid of the storm to now they've got fear towards Jesus. And they're asking the question, and it's really a question that you and I need to apply to our lives and make real. Because Doug talked about it last week with Easter. We know who Jesus is. He rose from the grave. We know who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. We know that God doesn't have to prove anything to you and me ever again. Do you ever think about that? God doesn't have to prove anything to you and me ever again. He proved everything on the cross the tomb, and the resurrection. Jesus rose from the grave. But as a follower of Jesus, how does that play out in our life? Now keep in mind, these guys were very accomplished sailors, and you might ask, well, how do you know that? Well, they weren't dead. They were still alive. They had to have been accomplished sailors. They knew that a sudden storm was very lethal. They knew that Jesus was a carpenter, and he could make a boat, but he didn't know how to steer a boat. And in a lot of ways, it's a last-ditch effort. In verse 25, in the Greek, I've been told there's only three words there. Lord, save dying. Lord, save us. We're dying. You know, we could start with Tanner, and we could work our way around the room, and each one of you could give a testimony here this morning. When are your most authentic prayers? It's not when it's smooth sailing. It's when our ship is sinking. Oh, the disciples had seen Jesus do a lot of miracles. They had seen him heal the blind man, the lame walked, They'd even seen him as he healed Peter's own mother-in-law. But nothing had ever evoked this kind of response. You know, most of us here this morning, we grew up in a rural area. You know, I think Ed, Mark, you guys know what it's like in the spring. It's usually during calving. And you can just tell when there's a storm coming. 
and there's nothing you can do to hold that storm back. You talk to anybody in Texas, there's nothing they could do to stop the ice storm. A fire that's coming down the valley doesn't care how much money you have. We saw in 2020 that a virus can shut down the world, but Jesus, Jesus is more powerful than any storm. And the disciples wake him up and he barely wipes the sleep from his eyes and he commands the wind to sit. It's almost like a well-trained pet. Be still. And it went from a deadly storm to dead calm in an instant, and that's not the way the ocean works. That wasn't natural. That was supernatural. You and I know as we read through the Gospels, Jesus made a lot of claims. Now, if you think about this, if your neighbor made the claims that Jesus made, you would stop going to their house. You wouldn't let your kids play with your neighbor's kids. If you had a family member who made the claims that Jesus made, you would be calling a mental health expert. In fact, C.S. Lewis said this about Jesus. He's either a liar and a devious one. He's a self-delusioned lunatic or he is Lord. And the waves went from, a, from raging to calm, and the disciples were confronted with the question, who is this man? And once again, Easter answers that question. But the second part of that is, what do we do with that? In Colossians chapter 1, it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. The disciples are asking the question, Who is this man that even the winds and the storm obey? I'll tell you who he is. He's the guy who spoke the world into existence. He's the God who spoke the world into existence. And in the Hebrew, the word literally means he created something out of nothing. He didn't take a little bit of dirt, add a little bit of water, make this ball, throw it up and call it earth. He spoke it into existence. Now, some of you here this morning, you are terrific cooks. And you can take a look at your cookbook and you can go to the cupboard and you can decide what you're going to make and you find all the right ingredients. And your husband comes in from a hard day at the field and there's these cookies coming out of the oven and you have just made his day because you're a terrific cook. But even you have to take something to create something better. When Susie and I lived in Omaha, used to love to drive uh, through Lindsay. And we would pray as we went through Lindsay, but I was always impressed with the fact that the Lindsay Center Pivot started in Lindsay, Nebraska, in this small rural town. And you think, wow, that was was amazing. But even those guys, they had to take something to create something better. They didn't create it out of nothing. Who is this man that calms the storm? He was a part of the Godhead that created the world. Jesus can speak to a mega-sized storm, and the world is created through him and for him. This is a God who is beyond our galaxies. And I don't know your story this morning. I don't know the storm that might be happening in your life. But can I just remind you how big and mighty and incredible our God is? As a side note, it's just interesting to me. I don't know why. It's the only time in the Gospels we see that Jesus ever slept. You ever think about that? When things were the worst. 
It's the only time we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus was sleeping. In Mark's account, Mark chapter 4, verse 38, the disciples say, said, Do, does he care? And yeah, we know that Jesus died on the cross, and yes, we know he was buried in the tomb, and yes, we know he rose victorious, but sometimes we get to a point and we ask ourselves the question, does he really care about my circumstances? One of my favorite authors is Max Lucado, and Lucado says, if hairs were hurts, we would all be grizzly bears. And if we're honest here this morning, maybe you and I have even asked the question, do you even care, Jesus? I know couples battling infertility and they're wondering, Jesus, do you care? One person said, why is it the two people who don't want kids can have children and my wife and me, we want a child and we can't have one? Or maybe you're sitting here this morning and you did everything that you possibly could to raise your kids in the Lord. You brought them to Sunday school and you took them to vacation Bible school and your vacation centered around God-centered things and now you have a child who's left the course of everything you've ever taught them. And you're asking the question, God, do you even care? Or maybe you're fighting chronic pain or disease, and you beg God, please take this away. Do you even care? I just want to remind you here this morning that Jesus calmed that storm immediately, but he doesn't promise to calm every storm. The Apostle Paul prayed to God, would you just remove the thorn in the flesh? And we really don't know what that was, but Paul just finally had to accept the fact that God said to him, my grace is all you need. I'm going to work best in your weakness. It's not what Paul wanted to hear. It's almost like God said, I'm not going to stop that particular storm, but I'm here with you. And I know that's not what you're going to hear from the televangelists in America, but it's biblical. The company I work for, they, we have a preacher's devotion every Tuesday morning, and to kind of kick things off this year, we, we had a devotion from a guy that actually went to Bible college with our daughter at Ozark Christian College, and he reminded us, you know, 2020 was a tough year, but if you're involved in missions, there's a lot of missionaries out there that 2020 didn't even make the top five. You see, you and I got to quarantine in air-conditioned houses. You and I, we could stop at Casey's and pick up pizza on the way home. But a lot of our missionary friends, 2020 didn't even make the top five. And millions of Christians around the globe can attest that God doesn't always stop the storm, but he's always there with us to walk through the storm. On Sunday, the last week, he talked about the empty tomb, and now you and I are on the other side of the cross, and we're asking the question, does he care? I'm all alone, and I'm raising these kids. Don't you even care? Don't you know how my stepfather treated me? Don't you even care? Best years of my life. I was going to work hard and retire, and then all of a sudden I had a stroke and a heart attack. Now I've got financial calamity. You and I know we cannot get through this life unscathed. But these questions, my friend, are answered on the cross. Who is this man? And does he care? I just want to remind you that he split history in two. There's more written about Jesus than any other person in literature. Jesus is the most represented person in art. He changed the landscape of history. Jesus was the one who changed how women and slaves and refugees were to be treated. And it's hard to deny that he is far more than a man. Does he care? He 
showed us he cared when he went to the cross. But you know, you and I can't talk about these things unless we make it personal. So once again, I'm going to just take a few moments and plow kind of close to the corn. Have you admitted that you need this God? Might be the only thing that the disciples did right. They admitted they needed God. And maybe some of you have been coming to Ord Christian Church for a while and you're becoming more and more enamored with the God who created this world. Maybe three months ago, Jesus wasn't even on your radar screen, but there's just something going on in your life. And I just want to ask you the question, have you admitted yet that you need this God? Over the years, I've had the privilege of meeting with a lot of different guys for coffee. Different times, I'd have what I call my key three, where there's just three different individuals, and I'd try to get together with them every week. And uh, quite often, I would, uh, for some reason, I got to meet with a lot of guys that excelled in athletics. Now, you can tell by looking at me, I don't spend a lot of time in the gym. No one has ever come up and said, you better slow down about lifting weights. You know, things aren't looking good. I, I am just not athletic. I always wanted to be. Uh, when I was in high school, I was too slow to play basketball. I was allergic to pain, and so I couldn't wrestle. And I had 20-20 vision, Tanner, so I couldn't even be a referee. So I'll let you think about that for a minute. Yeah. But one of the guys that I got to meet with was a guy by the name of Chris Faber. And he was a two-time NIA, NAIA All-American in wrestling. Uh, he was an outfitter in Montana. And he and I became, he, in fact, he's one of my final six. I, I've, it sounds kind of morbid, but I've, I've got my funeral kind of figured out. I've got who my Paul Bears are going to be, and Chris Faber is one of them. And Chris is just one of these guys that uh, he's a leader's leader. He's a man's man. And every now and then I would just say, Chris, where are you at? Where are you at in your relationship with Jesus? And one day Chris just said to me, so tell me, what's going to happen when I finally say yes? I'll tell you what's going to happen, Chris. You're going to get baptized into Jesus. You're going to get into the Word. You're going to become a leader. And one day you're going to be a leader in the church as an elder or deacon. And I'll never forget, he looked me in the eye and he said, you got one H of a job in front of you, only he didn't abbreviate it. And I said, I know, Chris. That's what makes it so tough. But I just want to ask you where you're at this morning. You... We've, we've gone through Easter, but have you gotten to the point where you admitted you need this God? Are you still fighting? And I just want to remind you, He is greater than any circumstance that you've come through, your fear, your hurt, your past. And He came down to walk with you, to be close to you. And there are some of you here this morning who at one time had, you didn't want to have anything to do with him. But one day, you're going to surrender to him and do whatever he asks of you. And maybe for the second group, maybe you know Jesus. You were baptized into Christ. You were immersed into Jesus. You joined him in his death, burial, and resurrection. But I want to ask you the question, is it going to move you in faith to do the very thing you fear? Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and our strength, and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give away and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam and the mountain quakes with their surging, we will not fear. There's probably somebody here this morning right now who the Lord is just continually prompting you to step out in faith and to do something. 
to walk across the, the section line and introduce yourself to your new neighbor, to get involved in teaching, to get involved in music, to get involved in missions. And the only thing holding you back is fear. And there are two groups of people. They look at the same situation. One accepts it by faith and one takes a look at it by fear. And when God says to you, when Jesus says to you, do not fear, he's calling you to be courageous. <clears throat> to let go of your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups, to struggle, to stop struggling in your walk in faith. And maybe right now you're faced with a big decision. It might involve your marriage or your family, your step in your spiritual journey. I don't know what kind of storm you might be living in right now, but you just need to look through it. You need to answer the question, who is this artist, the God of all creation, who is greater than our fears? And when you're going through the storm and you're clinging to the side of the boat and you're holding on to that life jacket, Maybe you can just reach up because Jesus is going to bring you a pillow. Because we serve a God who is greater, just simply greater than. You know, when I was a kid growing up, um, my parents actually ran the liquor store in the town in which I was a kid. And so I didn't go to Sunday school a lot when I was little. Except when my grandmother and my uncle, who was a bachelor all of his life, would stop by and pick me up. But I can remember as a kid going to church and there's just some of those old hymns that still just resonate. And I do not sing, so I don't want anyone to sing along with me. Where I'm just going to read one of my favorite hymns this morning. And then at the end, I'm going to ask you to join as we sing the, the final chorus. But I love the song, How Great Thou Art. And I just want you to listen, maybe for the first time again, to the lyrics. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe is displayed. And then we go into verse 2, and a lot of times we somehow skipped over that, but when through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, for me it was the top of Powell Hill, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. And then verse 3, he answers the two questions. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. And then verse 4, it's where we find all hope. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Let's stand and let's just sing the chorus together. My Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. 
Let's pray together. Our precious Heavenly Father, we're just so very grateful for the opportunity we have to come together as the body of Christ. And Father, today I pray that we will just be reminded of who you are and how great you are. That we will answer the question that you are the one who created this world and that you care for us. Father God, today I pray for Doug and his family. I pray, Father, that you just grant them a double measure of your presence. Once again, Father, I thank you for the Ord Christian Church, and I thank you, God, for the leadership. Thank you, God, for the elders who are the shepherds of this church and the deacons who are the, the servants. Father God, I pray that you will just continue to be at work upstream in our lives and that, God, you will provide those divine appointments. We love you, God. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.